and then we can uh, and then we can actually uh, uh, have the interaction with uh, you know uh, with Ethereum through Basu. So that's a pretty nice uh, interoperability concept over there. We can you know so we can have code will be used as the URL uh, layer and then then interact with uh, multiple chains. So so that's uh, pretty good. Um, and then lastly, the other update I want to in here is that this is something which is work in progress. So I don't have 100% specifics, but uh, just to share information, uh, David and I have been in touch with, uh, like David uh, um, and, and David Boswell and I have been in touch with uh, the Morgan State University folks. And we're planning to hold a metaverse conversation. And uh, the whole idea behind this conversation is expected to be not to, to, to really actually kind of take the hype out. Because as we all understand, I mean, this is just extreme level of hype out there in terms of like anytime you mention metaverse and all this stuff. So the whole point is that like how are blockchains really gonna enable metaverse and what's the role blockchains can really play in there? And it's not about basically, it's like, oh, you can just uh, spin up a land and everybody can be a land seller or their land, land owner. But what practical uses uh, can, uh, uh, you know, blockchains really provide in the metaverse context? So in this context, I'm actually also in touch with, uh, uh, in, in touch with uh, 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 file, and uh, we might actually bring it back uh, for a panel discussion. Oh, good. So, so just to share those updates, uh, I think that's it for now. That's excellent. I threw a link in there for Curve Grid uh, on the chat. Uh, looks very interesting. Sandy, thanks for that update. That's uh, you got a lot on the go. It's unfortunately, uh, I'll be honest, it's, it's much less than I was expecting because uh, quite honestly, like I, I got very, very swamped with my official work um, with, with a bunch of projects going on and uh, um, and then similarly, other folks who are working really closely with me, they got swamped with a bunch of other things today. And, you know, this is where, unfortunately, because we didn't fully have any dedicated uh, deaf folks, I mean, which is uh, what I was hoping that we can get as, as a result of the, uh, uh, the uh, mentorship project, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so, you know, with a lack of dedicated resources working on some actual dev, uh, you know, you can basically just, you have to depend on how much time people can just chime in. Yeah, and you can just do your best, you know, and that yeah. that mentorship program is a lot of work too, you know, it's not, it doesn't, uh, you know, in some cases that mentorship program will put a lot, put a lot of load on you and, and uh, but anyway, you know what, let's, um, you know, as we, as we get our footing here within the uh, MESIG, then uh, uh, we start drawing some people in, we can, we can maybe get some other uh, folks to help you with the, uh, with, uh, with with those tasks that you need. So maybe we can uh, have more of a discussion about that or maybe we can uh, put a bullet list together of things that you need done. And uh, we can't find some uh, some uh, some manpower, woman power to uh, to help you with that. So let's talk about that on uh, Discord or uh, at the next meeting or whatever you want. What do you think of that, Sandy? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, sir. I'll, uh, I'm going to. Uh, so that's the uh, that's it for uh, projects because um, uh, though uh, uh, we have some thoughts on projects and some ideas, uh, we're not uh, uh, we're 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 focused on uh, what's currently in the mill, and that is Sandy stuff. But uh, Kyle spent some time. Kyle is our uh, is our music lead and uh, spent some time uh, last week having fun and working the uh, Nashville Music Biz Conference. And uh, he's uh, here to tell us a little bit about uh, how that went and how much fun he had, if at all. Go ahead, Kyle, you got it. Yeah, I went very, it went well. I, I did have a lot of fun. It was a weird time to be there because it was also the same time uh, crypto hit a wall. <laughs> I don't know if you have attention, but um, in a sense, it was actually kind of nice to be there because we were, uh, the group I was with, we were distracted, uh, having fun at Music Biz and, and didn't pay too much attention uh, while everyone else in the crypto world was kind of <laughs> getting very upset. So um, 
And yeah, not everybody was uh, pouting. Nobody was complaining about gas yeah. prices, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <They> were, yeah. <laughs> so everybody was pouting, but you were still having fun. Good for you. Go ahead. Yeah, and then none of us had Luna, so we were we were really we were fine. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was, it was kind of weird. The first, the first day of the Music Biz Conference was all about NFTs. Um, so I actually really, the Music Biz people didn't really know what was going on. So um, it was fine. It really was fine. Um, and uh, we got to go to a lot of uh, parties um, and music industry people are very personable. And, and um, so parties are, are fun. And yeah, so there was a chat about uh, NFTs. The first day was... Um, quite a few conversations about NFTs. So it's definitely on the music industry's radar. Even the keynote speech at the very end, it was with Twitch and um, Warner. Warner said just out of the blue, since it was really a conversation about Twitch and all that, um, some of their artists have, top artists have made uh, more money with NFTs than they have with Spotify. So um, it's something that's definitely very, um, the right moment for the music industry. I actually just got off a call with the um, one of the leads before I, I joined this call. One of the leads in um, the MMF, um, the MMF.net, and they are uh, the large. Um, they have over one thousand two hundred managers. It's a big managers um, group um, in the UK, and then almost three thousand managers in the US. Um, yeah, so I got off the call with one of the leads uh, just now, um, and he and I had a yeah, really great conversation about some fairly low-level stuff, um, especially about DAOs and, and such. So uh, going back to the Music Biz Conference, um, also a couple of, um, um, yeah, one of the days was about metadata, and even though that isn't about blockchain uh, specifically, uh, that's what, um, as far as um, engineering side, that's really what blockchain is. Um, uh, one of the key areas where it's innovating. So one of the areas is artists can try new business models. So that was touched on with the Twitch conversation and, and the NFT day. But then the other area, kind of more nerdy, is I guess the way to think about it: creator credits to make sure that the um, metadata is lined up. So artists actually. Uh, get the royalties owed to them. And then there's also concepts of like beat per minutes and that kind of thing. I hadn't actually thought about it too much until I went to the Music Biz Conference. And, and so that's great for, um, those are tags, that type of metadata. And that's great for um, uh, synchronization. So actually music supervisors as clients, which is, which is also big business, but just B2B, right? Um, so um, not just B2C. Um, we had breakfast with DDEX, and DDEX is the uh, standards organization that the music industry uses. Again, on this creator credits, there's more royalties. They do one-to-one -one communication, so it's very different than how blockchain is structured. But I think for Hyperledger, it's really interesting um, with Hyperledger having private transactions. Um, uh, Hyperledger being a potential bridge between um, decentral nodes and um, this existing world that's one-to-one -one, uh, comms for the most part. So yeah, so we had breakfast with DDEX and that went great. They have invited us to their plenary that's happening in um, June 16th. So I'll fly down to Miami and, and have, a, have to prepare a presentation and DDEX is comprised of Google, uh, Tencent, uh, Universal, just all the big players. Um, the call I just had with the manager, um, that big manager group, uh, he said that it's actually, um, I think the conversations are, who he believes, and I, I, I agree with his logic, conversations are gonna go a lot mellower with the major players. So major players know they're gonna keep market segment no matter how things sh shift. Um, and so that means they're cool with just growing the pie bigger. Whereas with um, medium players, uh, they're concerned that they might take us uh, a smaller portion of the pie. Um, so they're actually a little bit, you 
one would think on the face of it that innovation and uh, um, playing around with hyperledger would happen with small to medium. Uh, it's possible though it's actually um, with these majors. So that's one of the reasons uh, speaking at DDEX Plannery is, is a fantastic opportunity um, because we'll be speaking directly to those majors. Um, so yeah, I've had a few other meetings at, at Music Biz Conference, but this manager guy I just got off the phone, which is now that's, I also met with him at the Music Biz Conference. So that's why we chatted again today. Um, so I think it went great. The other people that went along with me, I set up a whole delegation. So there were um, two DAOs that were physically there with me. Um, one of them is named Unchained Music and they call themselves Web 2.5 because they are dealing with distribution in Web 3, but they're also dealing with distribution uh, just traditional. So they um, put music up on Spotify, but then they also are figuring out these new organizations. One's named Player, but P-L-A-E-R, like the Ashen. Um, and that's in car playing music, but uses NFTs. Uh, so they're distributing with those people. But again, they're just distributing with Spotify. So interacting with uh, Unchained Music has been great because I'm also that, um, I guess, more bridge between the, the existing industry and then uh, the, the potential future industry. Uh, then the other one that went with me is StemsDAO. And StemsDAO, I'm working with them on developing the uh, legal documentation for how artists are signed when uh, the uh, label slash publisher is monetizing not just the copyright, but the NFTs. Um, so so there, that was the other delegate that went with me. And then there was a delegate that they were in Australia, so they couldn't uh, attend, but um, they're called Motodow. And Motodow has, um, has raised a lot and they've got Dead Mouse uh, sign. So they're for the big deal. And, and so this guy, even though he couldn't um, be with us there physically, he had his Rolodex in the music industry is just amazing. And so he set up, us up with a lot of these meetings. Um, I set up the music biz one, or not music biz, uh, I set up the DDEX one myself, but all the rest of the really important meetings we had was pretty much because of him. So i um, really grateful for his assistance. And things are moving forward, basically. Um, and yeah, as Brett said, there's a couple projects we have in mind. One project is um, very ambitious. The other one is more, I think, um, short term. Um, so. Uh, we'll confer a bit before we propose those, but I'm, I'm excited for both of them. It's just when, where, and how. Um, happy to answer any questions more specific to Music Biz Conference. Uh, um, lots of free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, that's great. Um, can you just uh, briefly describe, uh, and um, for, uh, I started the recording of this later than I should have, but um, can you just briefly describe uh, what a little bit about the uh, Nashville Music Biz Conference and uh, just how important and how sig insignificant this is? And then uh, uh, I have a couple of things I want to ask, and if anybody else has any other questions, that uh, that uh, so yeah, just just so we can get a feel for uh, the importance of uh, Nashville. Well, we already know the importance of Nashville in terms of an and by the way, Kyle lives in Nashville, but uh, uh, the, we know the significance of Nashville to the music industry, but how important is this music biz conference and uh, how long has it been going on for? Go ahead. Oh, how long has it been? It's been going on for quite a few years. I don't know that exact number of years. That's a good question. Uh, it used to be held in LA. Um, so it, it switched to Nashville. I don't know when exactly. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know the details, but it's the largest music conference um, on the business side of things that happens every year. So um, it's it's very important for, you know, when people think about music events, obviously Grammys, right? It's almost like the Grammys for the people that are doing the um, underbelly stuff. So for instance, metadata. Um, so when the performer rights organizations talk to um, the, uh, um, so like, for instance, one of the big um, sponsors of the, of the event was Payoneer. Uh, and we had some good conversations on Chains of Music, especially with, with Payoneer uh, about crypto 
because um, they have to use Circle and uh, Payoneer has a great tax system and all that. So one wouldn't really think about Payoneer as a really important part of the music industry, yeah, but um, that's how the cash flows. So that's why this event is, is so important. It's uh, off the radar for most people um, because it's not, there's a few entertainers there, um, but not many. And they were there mainly to speak about their particular use cases. So I think, yeah, there was one entertainer, I can't remember her name right now, but um, she uh, did a deal with Budweiser uh, for NFTs. Budweiser had an NFT release. And so she played a show um, in St. Louis and met the Clydesdales or whatever. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the, the, uh, yeah, the whole thing, but, but otherwise it was, it was fairly technical chats for, for the most part. Um, but again, yeah, this is the biggest, uh, music industry is actually fairly small. So it's not like the conference is a gigantic conference, um, but it's the largest of, of conference of its type for the music industry um, per year. So great thing for blockchain um, uh, engineers to attend, uh, especially as, as NFTs become more and more uh, an important aspect of the industry. Carl, do you, do you think that, um the technology uh the uh, the advent of uh web3 uh, nfts are kind of similar to uh what spotify has done to the uh uh, uh done to the music industry do some of the business people in the music industry feel threatened by technology and uh, the legacy uh methods of making money and how they're going to be upset by uh, by the new by the new ways by the nfts a lot of middle people are going to be cut out uh as uh, you know in that respect a lot of uh, a lot of industries are going to be affected legal tech is going to be affected by by uh from trademark copyright all that ip stuff what did you get a sense at the music industry conference that uh, there was any threat? Well, I think uh, that might be one of the perks of the, um, all the crypto hitting that wall. Was I don't think people felt very threatened. Uh, I think they felt sorry for <laughs> yeah. us because it was a, it was a bloodbath out there. Yeah, good, <laughs> good point. Oh yeah, so I guess that was that was beneficial in, in that way. Um, and there are definitely people that though, if if we just think about it, are are threatened. I was actually very encouraged and surprised how that was not really the energy I experienced. So obviously there are people that yeah, and and I and they, my call just earlier today contextualize who's more likely to be threatened um, and kind of surprised me, uh, but makes sense in, in, in retrospect, who's, who's not threatened, right? Who's actually excited about it. Um, basically the, the majors have money to throw into R&D, so they're not threatened because they just, um, I, I believe it was different uh, in previous cycles because uh, there was a shift to digital, um, from, from physical. And so th those models were, were very different and um, there was a bit of denial, but now we're, we're in digital and this is kind of digital 2.0 or 2.0, right? It's, it's not like we're creating the internet again, we're um, just maturing the internet, right? So it's, it's even though it's a big step, it's, it's compared to going from um, no internet to internet, it's, it's, it's a smaller step um, and, and they've figured out what works and what doesn't work. So especially in the past, copyright was really considered a monopoly. So get rid of any um, piracy period. And now they recognize, oh, that's not, a f that's not the important fight. The important fight is to figure out where the um, uh, bottlenecks are, the different platforms people are on. Um, make those platforms, that's especially useful. So for instance, audios, a lot of the people on the board are, are top music industry people. So even though Audios is um, not doing the right things with licensing right now, I um, and some people in the industry think that they're going to get a, um, a RIA knocking on their door and um, it's going to have to do a, a huge settlement. Other people think no, because it's it's the people on the board of music industry. So this is just a way for Audios to, to um, scale up quickly. Is is to worry about 
um, being the centralizing force. And then since they're like, you know, just have um, uh, first mover advantage, that kind of thing. And then since it's largely uh, the deciders are in the music industry, then that'll probably just get all, all squared out. So time will tell, but I, yeah, it does seem like um, administrators and such, um, definitely people that can be disintermediated in the music industry um, will be concerned. I focused quite a bit in the conference about new business models. So again, just growing that pie. So not about where we're um, cost savings, but where we're bringing in um, uh, core relationships with the fans, that type of um, thing that uh, I think is, is less threatening. And, and that seemed to be the energy at the um, event as well. Honestly, the parties that the party I interacted with the most that I thought would be the most threatened is DDEX. Um, during our breakfast, there was times where um, I definitely had to speak with a political mind, but uh, ultimately we were very open and excited about the future together. So um, I'm just very optimistic. I mean, they, they didn't have to invite me to the plenary, right? So, yeah. That's, uh, that's impressive. You got that invite. Congratulations on that, Kyle. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of blockchain and music. If what what your just a simple reaction to what you see that being, and uh, um, for anybody out there that is uh, that is on the business side of uh, of uh, the music industry, uh, the technical side of the music industry, blockchain, uh, et cetera. Um, what, what's your opinion on uh, what the low hanging fruit is? Where's the, where's the place to go? Is it, is it IP? Is it all IP? Is it, is it payments? Is it uh, distribution? Uh, what, what do you, what do you, what's your opinion on uh, I know you have a, your, your field is, uh, is in a certain, um, uh, you have a certain field and, and, and that's maybe where you're best at. So that might be where you would, would uh, look, but uh, is that the, uh, what, it, what is, what do you think it is? The, uh, the low hanging fruit is everybody, where, where is everybody gonna start going in the music industry once it really catches fire? Hmm. So I feel like low hanging fruit and where everyone's gonna go are, are there's an important distinction in that um, what's, um, cool and sexy and all that, that's where everyone's gonna go, right? And so in that case, it's artists selling NFTs. Um, oh. and, and just thinking about the first event, that's what it was very much about. Um, again, what, what did they have? They had an artist who, um, she was very glammed up talking about being a Budweiser. So right, so they just went full on um, um, exciting media and entertainment uh, with, with their, their narrative, right? Um, when, I, when, when they were talking about metadata, I, that I think on a technical level and for low hanging fruit, there's quite a bit of that there. Um, but because it's uh, very dry, I don't think a lot of people are gonna run towards it. It, it. it has that potential to be niche and make a good amount of money. Um, and, and niche in part because it's, because uh, it, it is dry, right? Um, so uh, how much money can, I guess when low hanging fruit, I'm thinking about um, business potential, then, um, I feel like that where the energy is going to go isn't necessarily going to go to, to maximize business potential because energy is also going to um, just kind of go where the emotion is. And a lot of the better business potential, um, there's hardly any emotion, um, uh, which is why there isn't very much competition because people are just doing it really for, for the business. Um, and yeah, so for myself, what I, I think is really exciting and longing for just because of what we're building in Lexdal, um, and so what actual tools we have in front of us, and that's what's really important, right? Is what tools do, do, does the individual who's thinking about the longing and fruit have available to them and in, in, in their immediate, right? And so for Lexdal, we're doing DAOs, spinning up DAOs, and those DAOs are legal entities as well. And so the idea of artists creating their own DAO. Um, and that's why I just got off the call with the management about, they're also very excited about that. I feel as for, for my opportunity base, one of the lowest hanging fruits out there. Um, 
And then another low hanging fruit is really understanding the difference between the copyright as IP and then this blockchain assets as IP and a very different kind of IP. So we know trademark is different from copyright, which is different from patent. Um, and I personally believe, um, and I haven't heard other vo very many other voices articulate this, so this is my own legal theory, but I personally, other people have said some stuff that's, I'm not the absolute only person that has this legal theory, um, uh, but it's that the IP that's on the blockchain is not just different from copyright, trademark, or patent, all that, but it's, um, it's also um, categorically different because it's, it's, use, it's not using statute as its basis. It's using what I would consider tort. Um, and so that's why I've known other people say blockchain IP is tort. They, they've said things similar, like it's about control and possession and all these concepts to me that are natural law, law of equity, and it's just like gravity, it's just, it's there. You can't really do anything about it. And so uh, legal frameworks build around it more bottom up than, than top down, which is what's statutory where you have legislation um, and then it kind of artificially instates it. And so I guess maybe it's kind of confusing why blockchain IP um, would be tortious because in some senses it's artificial because code is artificial, um, but it's, it's, I think sufficient, sufficiently removed enough um, from um, the individual makers uh, that it just becomes this kind of um, emergent uh, uh, nature. But that's why I consider tort is a little bit better to understand it than, than through statute. Because statute still is dialogues between individuals. And so everyone can still kind of shape it with their own hands. But, but for, for blockchain type uh, IP, people can shape little pieces of it. But the overall thing um, is it's own creature that not know any particular individual can take down. I mean, that's all kind of the whole point about distributed ledger, right? Is that you don't have that ability um, to have centralized control. And so when there truly is no centralized control, that's when I, I, I personally believe con concepts of uh, property that uh, pull from areas of, of property law that um, so far RP hasn't pulled from um, are, are going to be very useful. And, and that's why it's world hanging fruit because it's not creating brand new concepts of property law. It's just recognizing that we um, should take this a high tech and consider it actually much more akin to really low tech. Um, and so the business models we can build out of it. Um, that, that, that is what I'm personally focused on, namely with STEM styles. I'm, I'm helping them build their um, artist uh, um, contractual relationships. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's where you were thinking that I would take that, but. <laughs> Well, you took, yeah, you did. You did a lot of low hanging branches out there. I mean, <laughs> so that's, that's a good thing. That's, that, that means opportunity, right? I have one last question for you. I won't hog the floor here, but uh, you and I were kind of chatting offline about, uh, about the, uh, about Tennessee and uh, Wyoming uh, recognizing the Dows. And uh, so did, can you do a, can you can you give us a little? Uh, Jordan Teague was uh, she's on your uh, Lex Dow team. What what's the big no no with her about uh, about Wyoming and Tennessee? I mean, I thought that would be pretty cool. I mean, I've I've gone through the Wyoming stuff and it looks pretty interesting and it looks uh, looks like a great start. Tennessee, where you live has adopted that. I thought you'd be uh, jumping for joy, but uh, somebody on your team is uh, is throwing cold water on it. Can you, do you, have you got a good feel for what, what her problem is with it? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I mean, that's why you get a bunch of lawyers to talk it out, right? <laughs> Someone's going to throw cold water if it's a, um, a very thoughtful community of lawyers, right? It's, it's, it's about being the uh, contrary, and no matter what. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, she does have... have um, I am actually fairly persuaded by what she's saying. It's basically what are the constraints um, that are unique to the DAO structure? Um, um, and it seems like they're not necessarily benefiting the person who's creating the, the um, legal entity. Um, it, they might be more beneficial to society at large or um, to the, um, uh, the government, but are they actually better for that private, the private parties that are, are going about making it? 
Um, and so when she analyzed it, that's was where her comment, um, uh, her comments were. It's, it's that um, with, with things like a series LLC or just a normal LLC, then uh, there are fewer constraints. It's a more generalized vehicle. Um, and that means that the parties can uh, decide on their own what they, they um, would like as constraints. So I suppose part of it is um, how much do you want the rails to be built for you and how much are you comfortable making the rails yourself, right? So it could actually be beneficial for people that aren't, aren't very sophisticated to go with the DAO st structure because then they can't get themselves in trouble um, because they don't know what they're doing, right? Um, but for people that are more sophisticated and, and Jordan is very sophisticated, one of the more sophisticated people around these days, um, I feel like she'd rather uh, take off the training reel, wheels, right? So I, that's kind of more, I feel how she perceives this. So one piece that I, I, I definitely can take um, as an example is that the, the code that determines um, um, uh, how uh, decisions are made and all that um, can be modified or, or must be modified, I believe, both Wyoming and um, uh, Tennessee. So that uh, the, the parties don't really have a choice to make it so that it's immutable, that it can never be modified. And then there's the question of, well, what do you mean by modification? So there's a little bit of ambigu ambiguity in there. So not only is it telling, um, we're, we're a, a, a structure like just normal Delaware LLC isn't going to give any comment about um, structure period. So then it has to be put in articles of incorporation, how that works out, but it's, it's up to the parties to fill that constraint in because it's not even contemplated in the more generalized. Um, and then with these, DAO legislations, they uh, make those constraints. And, but then there's a question of, because this is a brand new world, um, what does that actually mean? So does it, does it constraint help um, people not get themselves in trouble? That's distinctly possible, yeah, because they might have uh, code that is buggy and they need to fix it or whatever other reasons, right? Um, but then at this point, because it's an un, um, it's not a well determined area law. That's where uh, litigation can happen because that's where disputes, one party might perceive the statute in one way, another party might perceive it another way, and there's no case law where um, if the parties um, take it upon themselves to articulate the relationship, they're going to have that back and forth uh, while they negotiate it. That they're more likely to have an understanding of what these obligations are. So that, that's a, a particular example. However, that said, um, it, it's really fantastic that the uh, government is um, through these type of uh, legislation saying, we want DAOs to stay around. We think they're a value add in the long run and we all want to figure it out together. So I am part of a working group, a DAO working group right now that has uh, the Blockchain Association on it, City DAO, uh, Lobby3, um, also um, Bankless DAO, uh, a few others and we're growing fairly quickly we uh, one of our main points is to have conversations with um, the legislature legislators um, to so that we all can have a much more thoughtful win-win scenario so we definitely these um, Wyoming and, and Tennessee DAOs those those are on our radar and we, we hope to have discussions um, with the uh, the lawyers who actually drafted them um, to, to, yeah, so it's a good start, I guess. <laughs> and in that way, I'm, I'm, uh, Jordan was just being, um, uh, yeah, she, was, she, she had very good comments, but I think she also agrees that it's a good start. And we're all very pleased in the direction things are going. Good story. Uh, I think you explained it well. I just threw a link up there uh, on this, uh, this article between uh, are in um, that I that uh, Kyle and I were chatting about uh, at Tennessee following Wyoming. So, uh, so that's good. I don't know if anyone has any questions for uh, Kyle on uh, on any of the stuff that he's been uh, been talking about here today. Go ahead if you do.
Hey, Kyle. Uh, yeah, no, this is, thank, thanks for sharing, Kyle. Uh, I think this is very uh, good information. Um, I, 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 I don't have any questions. I just want to comment, uh, like just add to us, uh, to what you were saying, basically, um, in, in terms of low hanging fruits and, uh, you know, how when you go to these music festivals and uh, like one is all the glam stuff and then obviously people want to pile in on that. Uh, you talk about the data, you talk about the, you know, stuff like that, that's obviously boring stuff. Uh, uh, there's nothing sexy in there. <laughs> so I can totally relate to that, like 100% on the banking side too. Um, but I think this is something, um, I think I think especially, uh, like two specific things I was actually making some kick notes on is, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, like the, the ownership, uh, I, I think there's a lot of things going on. Like, have you, like, are there any specific articles or any specific, uh, like, oh, I'm, I'm actually wondering, even as a part of this group, I mean, would it make sense to actually have any, uh, um, maybe have a presentation or a conversation, especially around the concept of ownership uh, of NFTs? Um, and, and I think that's something we can also have in conjunction with the Nafuri team. Uh, you know, there's another uh, another project going on in the Hyperlater space is, is by the name Nafuri. And uh, the concept over there is basically to be working on uh, uh, low code or no code NFTs. Mm -hmm. And I think it might actually make sense to have a conversation together. Uh, I'm, I'm part of that team too. So I think it might actually make sense to have minds coming together and talk about especially talk about the ownership and stuff like that. Like you specifically, for example, you touched upon the points of like how it's really so much of toad and IP and like, you know, like in the trade difference between trademark and IP. And as we all understand, I think uh, obviously the general speak for like, like from a street point of view is this like, oh, you own an NFT, you can own the asset. But as we all understand, that's really very, very far from true. Uh, the only thing you really own is the hash on the blockchain, nothing else. Um, so like, how do you really prove the, uh, well, how do you really prove the provenance of the, the underlying asset and in two different contexts, right? Like, I mean, if you have an actual digital asset, which is totally digital, uh, it might be easier to basically say, okay, well, I have a digital signature. I can somehow prove the, the ownership of this. But if you have a digitalized as asset, which was originally like say a film or something, or even a, somehow like a, 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 a like a grafted a sort of an asset, which is kind of basically joined by merging multiple NFTs. How do you really prove ownership of that? So, so these are very cross-cutting concerns. Not only in the in the music side, it's, it's very much the same thing on the gaming side. Uh, you know, so it's very much the same on, on a bunch of different things. So, I think the question becomes: How do you really uh, take something which is not natively digital? and or, or, or somehow like in a partially digital and and now you're digitizing it for example somebody producing some music somebody doing something else and now you're digitizing it and how do you prove ownership of that um, especially if you have of course you have then obviously if you have any income streams coming out of that uh, so there's so many different things you know which can be spoken about over there so i, I was basically just going to say that i think uh, these are really important topics and i think it might actually make sense to have a specific discussion uh, I don't know if uh, Brett and Wendy, you guys already have somebody in mind today. We could probably set up a presentation, especially around that topic. Yeah, that would be say? excellent. I, I think that's a great idea. That's a very big um, issue in terms of true ownership, um, like you just explained. And I was going to just piggyback off of your comments and just ask how. How do the artists feel about this? Is this pretty receptive among them and also the fans? How do they feel about, um, really, I mean, do they really understand that they don't actually own the asset that they just own, just like Sandy described, just a hash? Um, uh, are the, play, the ones that are really, you know, soldiers on the ground, which are the, which are the artists and the, and the fans, do they really understand the implication behind it, behind the technology? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, because it's artists and fans, it's a very, there's a lot of different stakeholders, right? So, I mean, there are certain artists that they hear the word blockchain and they think, uh, 
it's harming the environment and they're just immediately um, upset by it, right? So they have just have that emotional uh, relationship and fans as well, right? So, um, and some artists need to be aware that if, even if they're for it, their fans might have that mentality and they could hurt their own brand. Um, this was definitely an issue last year. I don't know how much of, it, of an issue it is this year, um, but some artists have to think about it um, um, from a few points of reference that maybe we don't need to consider. So it gets fairly complicated. Um, uh, Sound XYZ is an example where they very clearly uh, don't even try to uh, have the copyright be what's uh, owned. Um, and it's really just the comments while you own the NFT that you can own. Um, and Sound XYZ has already brought in a few million uh, for artists. I do believe in those situations where the artists tend to sell out um, their NFTs, then in the short one, at least they're happy because they're making money. And for a lot of these smaller artists, it's really important to make money somewhere, somehow, um, just so they can keep themselves going. Uh, their fans, I could see their fans um, not understanding what they're uh, purchasing. And so um, them getting upset by it. That's one of the reasons though, that I'm really trying to keep the, um, bring in the word asset for NFTs. So respect NFTs um, as assets that can be worth a lot of money, um, but then also very clearly silo that away from copyright. So when I'm saying it's a, a tort IP, what I'm really trying to do there is, is use this um, legal concept tort that's fairly well-defined and then use that as a way to, to really um, keep easily in a brand ways, uh, keep separate that idea of, of it as an asset, a very important asset um, mm -hmm. from this whole copyright paradigm where a lot of artists don't really understand the copyright paradigm period anyway, right? Um, and so they just know copyright exists. They don't know the difference between the recording and, and uh, of a copyright. Um, but neighboring rights, which is a really big deal in the music industry. One of the reasons I think I got that plenary uh, meeting was because I, I uh, said, hey, th these NFTs are going to, the royalties coming from NFTs when we structure them well are going to be like neighboring rights happened just like 10, 20 years ago. Um, so this whole new area of, of, of revenue coming in, right? Talking to artists, uh, I would say a very, very small percentage of artists know what a uh, neighboring right is, <laughs> right? And they don't need to. Um, mm -hmm. They just know there's this whole copyright asset and they might, or IP and they might just, you know, copyright trademark, don't even know, doesn't, but they just have an understanding money comes in for that. And so if we can just, uh, my hope is as we can, if we um, uh, just say, hey, look, there's all that. And then there's this other thing, this NFT world, and that that is a different asset, but it's still a very important asset. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why bringing in concepts like tort, um, if we can kind of clearly separate those two ideas and, and um, the artist and consumer's mind, and just two ideas, so it's not that complicated. Um, mm -hmm. And I think people are going to um, not get up or um, we're more likely going to have everyone be happy um, with, with outcomes, or at least understand why outcomes happen in, in certain ways, um, if, if, we, if we can do that. So right now, it seems like yeah, a lot of the industry is kind of muddying the waters between uh, copyright and mm -hmm. hash, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. so what I'm really trying to do is um, <laughs> go the other way, have them very clearly differentiated, and then we can talk about putting to get together in, in, a, in a, um, a container. That's good, so, very I'm good. I'm just one voice, yeah. <laughs> think, yes, yeah, I, I just think that that's um, kind of um, a muted point that really doesn't get discussed. And not that you know anyone has to know um, the intricate parts of it, but just kind of knowing the flow and and how things work. So um, I'm sorry, Sandy. I didn't mean to cut you off, um, but I think that's a great idea. I think we should plan a meeting dealing with uh, a presentation, a panel discussion, something on that level. To just yeah, no, no, you didn't you didn't cut me off at all, Wendy. No, I agree. I, I think we could probably discuss this on Discord or something too, and see uh, what other topics we want to bring in here. But it seems like pretty uh, uh, pretty interesting and, and a pressing issue and the topic to discuss. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Yep.
Anyone else have anything for anybody here now? If not, we'll wind this up. Uh, Kyle, you and I are going to go. Uh, I'll I'll send you a link for a for another chat if you got a few minutes uh, on a couple of things. Um, I'll close this off here. It's being recorded. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Rapan, thank you for joining us. We hope you get uh, get that link set up uh, for our next meeting and reminders at the uh, uh, join the uh, the MISIG uh, group here. But thanks for taking the time to uh, join us. And Kyle, thank you for your time and a great uh, uh, presentation. Sandy, thank you. Randy, thank you. Good to see all you folks. And uh, we'll see you uh, maybe Friday. I'll be around doing uh, doing this presentation with, uh, with Jordan. And uh, she's doing the NFT squad. So that's uh, film. She's in cons, I believe, still. But... Uh, so we have some stuff coming up, folks. Uh, keep your eyes on the uh, on the wiki and the notifications, and uh, we'll talk to you all hopefully in another month or so. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye bye.